Come on now. Last time. This isn't hard. Like. Stop it. Go away. Hello. I hope I'm not misspeaking. Look at that curl. I feel like I'm going to prom in my new sweater. Hi, I'm Amy and this is the Half Calf Podcast where we'll talk about knitting and crochet and I'm out here on my deck at like 7 in the morning on a Sunday and so it's all quiet except for the birds and the distant freeway noise, but we'll pretend that that's not the case and it is magical. I almost feel like I have to talk more quietly so I don't disturb my own silence but I want to tell you about all the knitting. So it's been a minute since I've recorded. Uh, at first that was because I didn't have anything to show you. And then it was because, you know, life. Um, you can find me on the web everywhere as half calf crochet. Um, although today fully caffeinating. This is today's mug. It's double sided. Pink Freud. I love it because it's, of course, such a clever pun, but it's also a reference to uh, how much I love psychology. In fact, um, it was my major and I use it in my work every day, although not in an official capacity. I'm not a, a licensed therapist or, or anything like that. Don't know if I ever plan to be. It's probably risky to record out here, but I did it the other day because I had to, because I had no room in my house to find a good quiet space with the right light and all of that kind of thing. And um, it was rough. I had to stop every few <laughs> minutes for some noise or some cacophony or another. And um, something happened to the recording, so it didn't even work anyway. But the light was gorgeous, so there you go. Anyway, so I hope that this works out recording early on a Sunday morning. Hope you can hear the birds. Um, I hope you have something warm or cool, whatever you like, to drink and relax in a quiet space so we can talk about knitting and crochet. I'm not sure if I have any crochet this time. We shall see, but I don't think so. So, check it. Finished the Into the Woods sweater by Melody Hoffman. So excited. It took forever. The yarn is, I've talked about this before, but the yarn is Gilead. It's Durerum Natura. I think I'm saying that right. Um, in the colors, eucalyptus and sage. So sage is the, the light green trees and eucalyptus is the main body of the sweater. I can't stand up quite properly, but I will go ahead and insert a picture here uh, of what the whole thing looks like. It's actually quite long and I did that on purpose. It's not comically long, but um, I did that on purpose because uh, I wanted to make sure that it hung low enough, not quite to reach my hips, but well, maybe you just kind of write it right about my hips. And uh, so, you know, because of that, I probably, I mean, I'm sure I had to lengthen it quite a bit because uh, hers is not crop, but it's, uh, I think it's, you know, kind of high waisted or basically at the waist. Um, Though that look is not a good look for me. <laughs> so um, I decided to make it longer. And then just because I was kind of worried about the fit, I don't want it to bubble up or, or hug my hips and kind of bubble up in the belly and, and stuff like that. So um, I made, I actually incorporated a split hem for probably about two inches, um, just as long as the ribbing is. Uh, when it's all said and done, I'm not sure I actually needed to do that. Uh, maybe, but it helped and it looks nice. Uh, what other modifications did I make? I probably made the sleeves longer. They, um, they're great length right now and everything actually, uh, lengthened. So possibly by an inch, maybe after I blocked it, I was kind of worried about the yarn being, making a sweater that's kind of stiff or uncomfortable. Um, you know, obviously didn't have a lot of drape, uh, but it did 
just soften and bloom beautifully when uh, when I soaked it and and blocked it. I actually didn't really block it per se because I didn't pin it or do I didn't need to. Um, so I just kind of draped it uh, over a, like an open backed chair to let the light or let the air come through um, outside because it's nice weather and I can do that. Uh, and that was that was fine. And I've been wearing it like crazy probably every other day. Um, it's been really warm so uh, this last week. So I think I've been wearing it a little bit less, but I probably finished this two and a half weeks ago. I have no, I have no sense of time with that kind of thing. Uh, but I have been wearing it a lot. And it's looking really good for having worn it a lot. Like I'm not getting a lot of pilling or everything. So I'm, I'm kind of loving this yarn. And this is the first time that I've worked with 100% wool. And so, yeah, to totally pleased. Uh, five stars would use again. As for the pattern, I definitely recommend it. Um, you know, well-written, beautiful. Um, this is essentially a dip stitch. And I don't think she refers to it as such in the pattern, but that's that's what it is. And when I was... I felt like I was learning to do it the first time uh, when I was working on this sweater, but I didn't kind of clue in until much later that I already knew this stitch, or at least was familiar with kind of how it, I don't know that I'd ever used it in a pattern, but um, I was familiar with how it worked and what you, kind of what you could do with it, but it just, I don't know, <laughs> it didn't click in until I actually started working on another pattern and realized it was the same thing, which I will tell you about that pattern um, as well. So, uh, definitely in love with the dip stitch right now and I'm working I just finished this one and I'm working on two other projects that um, that contain it the thing that I really love about the the dip stitch is that it kind of like right here the way it's used it looks like little trees and I don't see dip stitches I see trees right so very effective um, but a lot of times when you do uh, like dip stitches in a certain way and kind of stack them on top of each other to me it always looks like giant knit stitches like and so it's super cute and cartoonish in a way and I, that's something that i really love about it and i've seen that in a lot of different patterns like i said i'll show you a couple so that's what i'm kind of all about right now um is that dip stitch it's fun to say too <laughs> so now i want to show you i did um because this was taking so long i really wanted to get it done so that I'd have something to show in my podcast and because I wanted to wear it. Um, I, if you've, all 12 of you who've watched more than one episode of this, I don't know, um, have probably remembered that I was talking about how I wasn't sure I'd be able to wear it because I wouldn't finish it before, you know, summer. So yay. Um, but also that's why I was kind of working on it. I wouldn't say monogamously, but as monogamous as I get sometimes, um, and I kind of was in a little bit of a life slump, so wasn't feeling super creative. Um, so it kind of was like, well, it's the project that's in front of me. It needs to get done. It's just stuck in it, you know, so I'll do it. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but like whenever I hear someone saying, oh, I'm on Body Island or I'm on Sleeve Island, I assume that means that they're happy now because the hard part is over and they can just knit stock and that and not think about it. To me, that's like <laughs> stranded on a desert island that you don't want to be on. <laughs> like, um, and it's not because I don't like mindless knitting sometimes. I mean, you know, yeah, I, there's certain projects that I don't, you know, that don't travel well or that you can't Netflix and chill to and that kind of thing. So, Absolutely. But usually for me, when I get to that point, I'm like, okay, now how long till it's over, you know? So anyway, to each his own. My point is to break that up, uh, I did decide to do like really little fast projects just when I like couldn't stand it anymore. Um, so again, no fault of this pattern. It's just Hello, sweater takes a long time to cover your body, right? It just, anyway, uh, you get it. So I ended up doing a few projects during, um, including a test knit and another pair of socks. Uh, so this is that pair. This is uh, still the vanilla sock on nine inch circulars um, by Crazy Sock Lady. It's, uh, I, I did that before and showed it on my, I think my last podcast, in fact. So I just, I, I've been, kind of basically tweaking that pattern. I mean, it's a perfect pattern, but it's just, you know, for, for 
standard feet. And of course, everyone's feet are slightly different, wider, the toe is longer here, whatever, right? So you've got to, to get a really good fit, you've got to tweak a pattern to individualize it to yourself. That's just the case with anything. So I, I do like the, um, the nine inch vanilla sock circular nine inch. <laughs> come on now. The vanilla socks on nine inch circulars pattern. And so I've just decided to kind of stick with that and tweak it until I get it perfect. As I have said before, I usually like to save my crazy yarns for socks because I really do kind of prefer not much of a pattern on my sock. There's, there's so many really gorgeous, cool, like lace patterns and stuff, but I don't know. I just, maybe someday I'll get into that, but I just haven't as yet. So I like to let the yarn show through for socks. So I've just kind of picked this one to, um, to run with and tweak. And I do think that I finally got it. I might need a longer heel flap. I haven't decided. Uh, so I might try that. I did try it on here, but only a little bit. So I think I need to do it a little bit longer. Um, so I might try that next go around. Uh, but I did all the tweaks and I think it worked. So I cast on 60 instead of 64. Um, this is cuffed down. Then I knit the cuff, uh, made the heel flap a little bit longer. Just a little though. I mean, it doesn't really look, it still looks pretty short, um, as I said. And then I went all the way down. I've already kind of been wearing these. You can, you can tell. I've been wearing them a lot because they work, they fit. Um, and then the toe, uh, I started with more stitches. So I think I started with 20 stitches and then decrease down to, I've written it down, don't worry. <laughs> I have been taking very good notes so I can do this again. Um, anyway, I ended up with 14 stitches. Uh, was it on each needle? Yeah, on each needle to do the Kitchener graft together, um, giving me kind of like a wider toe at the end. I love that. Um, I like, sh I always like shorties. I never end up uh, doing a longer cuff. Um, so this suits me just fine. The long tail cast on is working. It's giving me the right, um, that with the stitch count is giving me the right, uh, snugness on my ankle. Here's what's funny is, I mean, I think it's funny. Uh, I have always thought that I prefer in my long history of sock knitting, I think I've knit like not even 10 pairs yet. <laughs> but anyway, I've always thought I'm toe up. But I don't think that's true. There's some logic about why toe up might be better. There's arguments about why cuff down might be better too. I mean, of course. Um, but basically, if you take a ball of yarn and you divide it in half to make sure you have equal amounts in each ball, and then you knit each sock from that ball, if you go toe up, then you'll be sure to have enough yarn for the entire foot and can just go and go and go until you run out of yarn and the leg will be as long as it is, as long as that works out. And then uh, do that for the other sock and they're even and the leg is just as long as it needs to be because you can, I mean, if you, you can may have preferences, but the leg can be here or it can be here and it'll still fit. But if you run out of yarn for the sock or for the toe, uh, no fit, right? <laughs> so um, great. That totally makes sense. Um, you can also try it on as you go to make sure that the toe uh, fits and that kind of thing. So, you know, yeah. I'm always thinking, and then you don't have to Kitchener, right? And that's good too. But I realized I don't mind the Kitchener. Now, I'm I'm actually starting to mind it a little more than I used to. Uh, but then I found a good way. And anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. I don't really try on my sock. I maybe did like once or twice because it was like, oh, look, I have a sock, you know. But uh, that doesn't really tell you anything. Um, because you have to wear... Uh, socks for, you know, a good day or two, um, post blocking, if you're going to block it at all. Um, I don't typically, this is just for display. Um, but you have to wear it to really see how it's going to fit. That's kind of one of my problem was, is that I didn't realize how much negative ease I would need. And so I'd make the sock to, you know, fit nice and comfy and then wearing it, it loosens up and pretty soon it's flopping around your foot. Right. So trying it on, doesn't super help. And after you kind of 
know what your foot size is, you, you know, you don't really need to try it on. You know that 60 stitches is going to work or, you know, in my case. So that's kind of a, I don't know, a false economy. It doesn't really matter. Also, all the toe up cast ons that I've tried are kind of fiddly. I mean, they're fine and they're sort of amazing, uh, you know, what they do. Um, and how, how they work. And so I can absolutely do them, but they're not as easy as the long tail cast on. That's just what I've memorized. That's kind of my go-to. Um, so you have to, I have to mess with a cast on that I don't prefer. And it's so funny. I think knitting's that way anyway, that the beginning is always the hardest part. The cast on is always the most fiddly. You don't have, um, a lot of fabric to kind of straighten everything out. So it's twisting around the needles. I mean, you know, it's just, that's just how knitting is. The beginning is always the hard part. So it's very prohibitive in the beginning. It's not a, not good. I'm glad we all still make it. Hi, surprise, costume change. <laughs> it's later this evening and I've discovered that some of my footage was missing again. So I figured this time I'm gonna try different outfit, different time of day, different drink. Cheers. So I could have just let it go, but I still wanted to show you a few things. So we're rolling with it. And then you'll be popping back to me in this morning. So I'm gonna do a bit of time traveling. It's gonna be okay. So I think I was in the middle of telling you about a sock. I think you get it. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, the next finished object I wanna show you is something that I showed you before. I think I had finished one of them. Um, so now I'm going to show you them both and tell you a little bit more about everything I did. I hope this is not a full repeat. These are the underwing mitts by Erica Hoyser or Huster because I always say, I figure one of those is right and one of those is wrong, so I say it twice. Uh, underwing mitts has become a favorite pattern of mine. I will definitely make it several more times. So here are the latest finished ones. So I made several little tweaks, nothing major to the pattern, but a lot of little minor fit things to just really make it perfect, even though I don't even know if I'm keeping these or not, but uh, you know, just in case, right? So first of all, I did, I wanted to use my Addy Flexi Flips. So um, those are a size one and I only have one pair of Addy Flexi Flips. So I was gonna do this in the size one, which means I wanted to do the ribbing a little bit smaller because it does tend to, not get floppy, but it, I wanted it to fit a little snugger at the bottom. So I actually did this in size zero DPNs and then worked um, in size one Addies all the way up. I also did uh, size, size one. I don't think I went up a size for the thumb, um, but I did a size one uh, DPNs for the thumb as well. Other little changes, um, I think the most significant one is that I want it to be, to come taller on my hand. Uh, so it, I added quite a bit of length. I added from basically, you know, I added this whole section right here. It seems like quite a bit to me. <laughs> um, so that it would come up slightly higher. I could probably have them even higher, but they were, they were kind of falling right here on me and I wanted them to at least reach my finger top, fingertips. Um, what else did I do? I added a tiny, tiny bit of room in the gusset, I think, just sort of like added maybe one more stitch. And um, this yarn is Knit Pick Stroll. Uh, I don't remember what color, green, you know, some kind of green. Um, and the, I used some, a different yellow for the moons. They're not variegated. Honestly, it was from Stash and most of it's gone now. I don't remember what it was. It was probably a mini I acquired a long time ago. Um, but I do remember that this whole variegated uh, yarn, this kind of yellow and with pops of like little peach and stuff, if you can see that. Um, that is uh, from a, uh, a a Christmas advent from Dragon Horde Yarn. Uh, it was one of her fey advents. And this particular colorway was a mini called uh, Green Children. So as I said before, I'm st they look really nice, I think. I'm still not really sure on the color combo. Uh, I did think they said spring, so that's good. I, I still think that. These are kind of like little floral notes, I think, but, um, you know, variegation, variegated yarn is sort of just, it's kind of a hard sell when you're trying to get a really clear uh, picture pattern. So 
I think it's all right. But I do think next time I really should just stay away from variegated altogether and see how it turns out. In fact, um, this is called the underwing mitts because she usually has you fill in the bottom two um, wings with uh, doing a double stitch, overlaying a stitch uh, in some, you know, bright, sparkly color so that it'll kind of pop. And I just haven't done that yet because, I don't know, the rest of it seems kind of busy, so I don't want to... At, I don't know, introduce a new color or that kind of thing. So I would like to do that too. <laughs> so um, I think next time I will stick to solid colors and then have that little zing of, of uh, the underwing to give that a try, see how it looks. Anyway, these may be in my shop, um, which is on Etsy at Half Calf Crochet. Probably. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> okay, next up is a test knit that I did. This was really quick, a lot of fun. It did a lot to kind of help me break up that, uh, that long sweater I was working on. So. This is uh, the Skull Beanie, obviously, <laughs> um, from Skulls and Hooks. And I tested it for her a couple weeks ago. This, the yarn is, um, I think Woolies Thick and Quick. It's a super bulky, so it's a size, a category six. Uh, the colorways, this is Glacier. This is Peacock. And um, this is kind of a like a teal, so it goes really well together. And then I ended up just kind of looking through my stash for the, you know, pom-poms that I have. I have probably, I don't know, a half dozen in various colors. And um, I thought this was the best fit, and I thought, you know, it's kind of nutty green. It's like a mint, crazy mint green. I mean, there goes my light, so it's going to be changing before our eyes. But, um, but I think it works. So even though, yeah, so I, I hope that works. This is adorable, of course. And I really think it's a perfect pattern, um, especially for beginners that are trying color work. I mean, first of all, it's two colors, just the main color and the opposing color. Um, it's a quick knit because it's bulky. And then um, the color work, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. And the only time you would have to carry floats would be like on these two rows. Uh, you know, some people prefer to carry, I mean, you might want to carry, I might have carried them on here too. Um, so I didn't cross, what, five stitches? because five stitches in bulky yarn can be a, a fair distance, right? Um, but it'll give them a little bit of practice carrying floats, uh, uh, just general practice uh, doing color work, but it's not uh, lengthy and it's not like a super, you know, major investment on a color work yoke that you may feel like you're gonna mess up uh, on, a, on a sweater, it's just a little hat. So I think it's a perfect first pattern um, and really cute. The fact that it's bulky makes it cute. The little skulls, they're little, um, they don't have mouths. So they're kind of just, I don't know, for some reason that's cuter. <laughs> I feel like, I don't know why. Um, so I heartily recommend this pattern. And it's been test knit and good to go. Everyone loved it. And then I want to share kind of a not so successful one, unfortunately. Um, this, I actually really love the, the pattern, um, but I feel like the pattern needs a lot of tweaks to really fit and look nice. Um, some of them is just a kind of experience as a knitter, like you know what cast on will look good. If, if they don't suggest a particular cast on, you know, you can kind of decide what you think will look good and, and apply your expertise. So that's fine. It's not a huge fault with the pattern, but I do know that um, it seems like uh, I definitely needed to cast on more. I've made this pattern like three times. Uh, and I, I think the first time, first couple times I did notice and remember to change it. This time I didn't. Um, so I kind of got a non-functioning hat, at least for an adult. I think it'll work for, um, yeah, a kid's head probably. Um, anyway, here, let me just show you while I'm talking about it. This is called the Adirondack hat. I'll put it on the doobly-doo in the screen and stuff. Um, what you do is you work, uh, well, this is, let me tell you about the yarn. This is the, uh, this is Barocco Alpaca, Ultra Alpaca. So it's all fuzzy. I really love just the pattern of the color work on here. It's like, you've got like little hills and then trees. And these are each sort of like individual, like snowflake looking with a little one stitch that looks like a little heart in the middle. Um, 
So what you do is you knit an extra long uh, ribbed cuff so that it's, it is intended to fold up. Um, but this is only like 60 stitches. And even in um, chunky weight, which this is, uh, it's not enough. It's, it's meant to fit, it's meant to be like an 18 inch circumference. And that's too much negative ease. Um, that's like four inches of negative ease for the average adult head size. Uh, so I think in previous times I've added stitches. I didn't to that. Uh, to make matters worse, um, I did fold up the cuff. If I'd left it longer, it probably could have worked as far as like the length, you know. I think it still wouldn't have fit, but this is also short too. Uh, so if I left it unfolded, maybe that would have fixed it, although I'm not sure if I would have liked the proportions. But to, to make matters worse, when I folded it up, I didn't really like how the edging looked. I should have done a tubular cast on. I was just lazy. So, yeah. So anyway, I didn't like how it looked, so I decided to sew it down. I didn't really like the shape either. Um, folding it up, but definitely sewing it down kind of made this a little bit puffier. So, I mean, I'm exaggerating it right here, but the shape is sort of like a bell shape because it sort of puffs out right here. The proportions are just a little odd. I do think some of that's written into the pattern, and so unfortunately it, it struggles. But I just, I, I will make it again and just make the modifications because there's just something about this... Uh, colorwork pattern that I really love that's super wintry and pretty to me. But unfortunately, I don't think I can consider this a success. Um, it doesn't, it won't fit an adult. Uh, but maybe it'll fit a child and they'll like it and it'll all be good because I'm not going to pull it out. Uh, fingers crossed. But I have enough yarn to make another one, so I'll try and do it right the next time. Okay, now, ready to go back in time? Close your eyes. One, two, three. Okay, so next I have works in progress and I actually tried to record this a couple of days ago and something happened to the recording. So I'm doing it again. And in the meantime, I cast on two new things. So now I have more works in progress for you. So the first one is called Constellate. And it is by Hunter Hammerson. The yarn is fiber optic yarns, just their fingering sock in the colorway ice, um, which you'd think would be kind of a really light blue, but it's actually kind of an intense blue, and I quite like it. Um, it has a long brim because it's supposed to fold up, and I'm trying to get it. Here is the progress I've made so far, and here are those dip stitches again that I've been doing. So this is really long brim so because you're supposed to fold it up. This has also a, uh, I think it's a twisted rib. No, no, not twisted rib, a uh, twisted pearl stitch uh, where you have to pearl through the back loop. Am I remembering correctly? Anyway, uh, it makes a really nice ridge on the inside and that's what will actually be folded up. Um, and so I really just started on the main body. Why is this so tweaked? There we go. <laughs> um, I really just started on the main body and it's basically gonna be this all the way up. So it's dip stitches stacked on top of each other, essentially. And that's kind of what I was talking about that I really love is um, how they look like gigantic knit stitches to me. Now they're a little, you know, like ropey, I mean, you know, obviously there are multiple uh, strands coming together, but it still kind of looks like that because it still sort of forms the V. I've been experimenting with it, and depending on how you finish and kind of lock down the, the dip stitch um, can also change what it looks like. So maybe I should show you this on the other pattern, but um, can you see how here there's a loop around the needle here and a loop around the needle here. And then you secure those by um, uh, slipping or um, you slip them for a while and then you stitch them together with another, with its neighboring stitch. A super efficient way to describe that, isn't it? Um, anyway, so it kind of opens up rather than having them all, you know, closed together. And it turns out that, uh, that the different way you, um, how you finish the dip stitch will make will determine how open that is. So I've kind of had a different, a couple of different looks. 
Um, this is a lovely pattern. It's really, really detailed. And so it kind of feels overwhelming at first. Like it's going to be a really hard project because there's so much information. Um, but actually it's just that, you know, she's kind of thought of everything and, um, it's, it's, a, it's a nice pattern. It's not as overwhelming as it, it seems, actually. Um, in this pattern, she shows you how to do the dip stitch. Um, there's no video or anything for it, but um, she's got, you know, graphics to show you how each step of each stitch goes. And I keep dropping my stitches, my goodness. Um, what else do I want to say about the Constellate hat? Just a little something funny. Um, yeah, I gave you all the information that I wanted to give you. So uh, just a little something funny in the, uh, uh, I've, this is something I've been having, I've had on my uh, key, in my queue for a while. And I finally decided to get to it because dip stitch, right? And I thought, oh, now I'm all about it. And oh, yeah, um, I think I didn't even remember what was called dip stitch, but I remembered, you know, that I wanted to learn more about that stitch because there is a pattern that I wanted to create for a while that uses that. And of course, again, I didn't know what was called a dip stitch. So I thought I need to learn how to make that. So um, once I got into the pattern, I thought, oh, of course I know what this is. And it was all smooth sailing. And now I'm just going to finish the pattern because it's a pretty hat. Um, but the funny thing about that is that she gives you details um, in the pattern information before you ever purchase it, you know, to say, um, this is what this pattern's all about. And at one point she says, um, this pattern is or isn't for you if, and gives kind of two different lists. And at the very, the very first, um, this pattern is for you if, the first thing is, uh, you really need to know what that's, how to do that stitch. <laughs> Yep. So um, I thought that that was so funny that she just kind of nailed me. And then it was funny that I already knew how to do it. I didn't realize it. Okay, so um, next work in progress, I'm going to show you. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and show you this one with the same yarn. So this is, again, fiber optic yarns in their fingering weight. And it's called, the colorway is called Ice. So it's still this intense blue. This is... Uh, I think it's kind of an Italian sounding name, so I might mess that up. Fior de, de Mare. It's a Chalette by, I will put it on the screen. <laughs> um, so I've just barely gotten started with this. Let me see if I can kind of stretch it out and show you. Um, but it's pretty and I haven't messed it up yet. So that's really exciting because, you know, lace can get intense. Um, so yeah, just started this great pattern, loving it so far, no issues. Um, it's, you know, complex just because there it's lace. And so, you know, every row is different, um, for the most part, it's charted as well as written. Um, I'm becoming more friendly with charts, but I would still say that I prefer written over charted. Um, and these charts kind of overwhelm me, uh, but I think if you like charts, you know, it'd be fine. But again, the pattern is written as well. So, um, so far I've had no uh, issues. I'll, I'll pop a picture in of what the completed shawl looks like. Um, it's very pretty. And I decided, I think I've decided finally, <laughs> this was the yarn that was reserved for the cardigan. I was going to make my friend for her birthday that's coming up. Um, and then I was having all these hesitations about maybe she won't like it. Maybe this, I don't know what I was getting. I was getting all fussy about it, but I think I finally decided that this is what I'm going to make for her. And so I started. So hopefully that question is laid to rest. Um, and I'm enjoying it. It's, it is an intense knit. You know, you have to pay attention to every row. And again, every row is different. And it's, as it gets bigger, I'll probably have to be really careful to not lose my place. And hopefully I don't mess it up too badly. Uh, cause just because it's intense, I'm not trying to put myself down next, uh, two more works in progress for you. I'm going to save what I think is the best for last. So the next one I want to show you is actually one, um, that I'm thinking of writing a pattern for. If I do, it'll be my first knit pattern, which would be really cool. I've done crochet patterns, uh, up till now. So I think I'm going to end up, um, frogging this because you know because I'm just kind of winging it there's no pattern I'm making up the pattern um so 
you know, you go along and you realize, oh, I should have, maybe I should do a provisional cast on because of this issue. And maybe I want it a little bit smaller or maybe blah, 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 blah. So, um, this is not representative, I think, of what it's going to look like, but mostly I'm also just kind of trying to work out the stitch count and how I want the stitches to look. And this is the diff stitch again. This is such a fun, crazy color. It's, um, bright lime and this is how long it is. And it's from um, Universal Yarn. It's Uptown Bulky. It's like bulky, like Category 6 bulky. I don't think it feels that thick, um, especially when you look at other things like uh, Lion Brands Thick and Quick, which is also uh, super bulky, it's a Category 6. And it seems fatter than this. Um, but it's all about kind of how it, you know, compresses and it's not just appearance. Um, but anyway, this seems more like a, maybe a chunky weight, but I think once you work it up, it's got enough bulk that it probably is. It just didn't seem like it. Anyway, this is so squishy uh, because the dip stitch, of course, layers, um, you, you, it's called the dip stitch because you dip down. Um, you don't knit on the same row. You dip down three or five or however much you want, um, and then pull up a loop through the, you know, several rows down and pull it up tall, which is why it makes all these little V lines, because you've pulled it up higher. Um, so you've got two layers of yarn, plus you've got stitches underneath. Um, and then it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm holding the, the whole, it's a tube, but I'm holding it also. So it's like five layers, four or five layers here. Super squishy. Loving that color is really fun. Um, so I won't tell you what this is going to be yet, but, uh, I've been practicing the dip stitch for sure. Uh, and I think it's going well. I've figured out all the things that I want to do with it. So we'll see if I actually release the pattern in the future, but, um, I'm definitely going to complete the object anyway, even if I, again, rip this back because I think I, want to start it differently and want to do different things. Now, here's what I was talking about with the dip stitch. I quite love this yarn. It's got a nice twist. Anyway, um, so as I started out, so I just did uh, like, I think five rows of three by one ribbing, essentially. Um, and then in the middle of the three is where I start. So there's three columns of knit stitches. I, I start the dip uh, by dipping three, four, or five rows down. I don't remember what I decided to do. I'm taking notes, don't worry. Can't you remember? I wrote them down in my diary so that I wouldn't have to remember. <laughs> um, and then, you know, pulled up this loop. Now, when you do a dip stitch, usually what I've seen um, is you pull the loops up, right? So you've basically got two extra loops for each dip stick, you know, each column. So I've got two extra loops, two extra stitches, essentially, for each column um, as you go around. So you, you go around and pull up all those loops. Then the next round, um, you basically just slip all those loops. And that kind of, I mean, in my mind, what that does is sort of straighten out. So um, you have to be careful of tension, of course, with dip stitches because you have to make sure that it's not too loose um, so that it's flopping around, but too tight that it's not buckling your fabric. Uh, so when you do the second round of these, you just slip them all. And I think that kind of makes it just a little bit longer and probably helps the tension just for it to kind of stand up a little bit more. And then um, the third and kind of final round of each dip stitch uh, is to knit the two together. So you, you knit two together here um, and you knit two together here. And of course that makes it so that your stitch count is back to normal. So in that final round, when you knit two together or slip, slip, knit or whatever, you know, again, you decrease <laughs> essentially twice, um, you can do it a couple of ways and you'll get a different effect. So I've actually got both effects in here and I'll show you. These first two, dip stitch here, dip stitch here, um, what I did was I started with a slip, slip, knit. I'm trying to think of the way I went. So, so to, to, uh, 
I started with a slip slit knit and then the next one I knit two together. And that makes these kind of open. If you can see this, here's the dip stitch that's, that would have been like the needle would have gone through right here. Um, so I slip slit knit and then knit two together and this sort of like opens them up a little bit so they're not all squished together. I wasn't sure I liked that, that open because it looks, it kind of looks like a flower, like a budding flower or leaf, which is pretty. Um, but it looks less like a knit stitch because it's, because it gapes. I hope any of this is making sense. So what I decided to do um, was reverse those. So instead I knit two together first and then I slip slip knitted and it definitely closed it up. See that compared to that? I think I like this look better. I honestly like them both, but if I'm trying to get this to look like big fat knits, columns of knit stitches, um, I think the closed looks better. However, I wonder if that also coupled with the, the fact that I'm stacking them really close to like, you know, like I'm stacking them really snug together. There's not a lot of space between each uh, row. They're stacked on top of each other. It kind of looks like a little bit of like a herringbone sort of pattern, which is nice. It's, it's I'm not sure it's what I'm going for. So I can't tell which one I like better. Um, I think it's this, but anyway, would love to hear your input which looks more like big fat knit stitches or do they both? That's what I'd like to know. So anyway, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not going to name it yet. It's just me making up my own pattern. Um, I'm figuring out how to decrease dip stitches in an orderly way. So yeah, and the yarn is really fun, super bright and springy. Okay, so I have saved the best for last. It's kind of a work in progress, but it's also a finished object. Are you ready? There he is. You thought I'd forgotten, but I didn't. Here is Frog of Frog and Toad. It's a pattern by Frog and Cast. Um, the yarn is, I think it's Nua by Stolen Stitches. Uh, it is a sport weight yarn. Yeah, a sport weight yarn. I think it's perfect. I actually bought this yarn and a kind of a more brownish green, darker color for an entirely different project, um, which I didn't end up completing. I, I frogged it. <laughs> See what I did there? And i um, so glad I did because this yarn is perfect uh, for this. Really happy. Okay, so... Got some tips for you, got some information about doing this. I haven't finished Toad yet, and of course I need to do that. And I will fil finish all their little clothes because I haven't even started on the clothes yet. Um, I think I'm being really picky about the colors, and so I'm actually gonna get, I'm gonna find the right yarn, not just use whatever from Stash. Because, okay, so first of all, this pattern is really great. Um, it's kind of expensive for uh, a pattern maybe, uh, but I do think it's worth it because what she does is, well, first of all, look at all this detail. Um, I mean, this frog has knees, right? And fingers and elbows, which I think I bunged up somehow because I don't see his elbows. But anyway, it's not just like, you know, stick leg average frog. It's meant to look like frog from the frog and toad books, um, by Arnold Lobel, Lobel. I don't know how he says it. And it does. So um, a lot of care and detail has clearly gone in to make sure that every, every little thing really looks how frog and toad look. Um, so I, I do think it's worth, uh, worth the price for sure. Um, and I'm definitely happy with how he turned out. So honesty here. I hated every minute of this. <laughs> I really did. Um, and it's again, not because of the pattern at all. It's because I find knitted amigurumi really difficult. And this comes from somebody who has knitted a ton, or, I'm sorry, crocheted a ton of amigurumi, um, tons of it, especially in, um, 
or earlier years. I've been crocheting for about eight years now, especially the first half of that easily was primarily like hats and amigurumi. So I've done a lot of it. And I've said before, it's much easier, in my opinion, to crochet amigurumi than to knit it. Because essentially in um, in amigurumi, you're knitting a bunch of small tubes and circles. Um, this is a tube. This is a tube. This is a tube. Uh, that's just, you know, that's just usually what it's compiled of. And then how long you make it, how fat, how you sew them together. I mean, that's really what makes the, the amigurumi take shape. And tiny tubes are easier to do in crochet. They just are. <laughs> you don't need DPNs. Um, it's less fiddly. You've just got one hook. Even if you've got small uh, yarn, you can do a magic circle and you're set. I was working with DPNs. At one point, you'd have like four or six stitches on your needle, uh, you know, and and having to decrease. Okay, we interrupted this regular podcast for some technical difficulties and a whole lot of motorcycles. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what was I saying? I was talking about frog. Oh, I just remembered. I was talking about the knit kitchener stitch, right? This is what I did it on. So, um, you, this is where the opening is for frog. Um, and you do a provisional cast on so that you can stuff him and then graft it together. Um, so that grafting that I did, that was the knit kitchener. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's pretty seamless. So that's where I kept the really good tension with a knit kitchener. So a couple of tips, um, if you're going to do this pattern, uh, be prepared for fiddly, <laughs> be patient, right? Um, the eyes might be the hardest part. I actually ended up doing crochet eyes just because I can, but uh, the eyes are really small. I think it's like six stitches maximum that you increase from, you do one and then you increase front and back, or knit front and back three times. So it's, you know, it's kind of intense. Uh, Sewing the eyes on was actually the intense part. The, the, um, and, and doing the, I mean, the short rows up here for the eyes and just, it's crazy. Okay. This pattern, it's so good, um, and detailed that nothing wrong with the pattern, but just knitting amigurumi and all these little tiny things in the short rows and making sure you don't drop stitches, which I totally did and, and found while I was stuffing. Anyway, I'm going to stop complaining. Um, I hated it. I love the product, right? That's what you're doing it for. I'm not doing it for the pleasure of knitting tiny little short rows. I'm doing it for the pleasure of having Frog. And he feels so good. Besides the yarn being awesome, um, he is stuffed using poly pellets. Uh, you know, you can use like, you know, beans or rice or whatever um, to stuff him. And that's what, I think that's what the pattern recommends. I definitely recommend it. So a couple of tips about stuffing. Um, first of all, do it over a pan or a tray or something that has sides so that you can catch whatever spills out, because it may. It may spill out for a couple of reasons. One, um, you, you sew a bunch of different, or I'm sorry, you knit a bunch of different tubes and you do pick up stitches uh, for that, but there will always be little gaps. There's a gap here, there's a gap here and here and here and here to close off the arms um, and legs. And then between the legs, there's a little bit of a gap. Um, so you're, you're supposed to sew that all up. That's part of the, the deal. But if you didn't sew it up perfectly, a little polyfill pellet might, you know, squish out. Or if you dropped some stitches and didn't realize it like I did, you might have to catch that. So um, as you fill your frog or toad with polyfill pellets, you'll discover where the holes are, which is, it's helpful, really. So it's okay. Um, so if any spill out because you accidentally spill them while you're trying to juggle everything, or if it because it comes out because you're, uh, you haven't sewn everything out perfectly, you know, either way, um, that can be handy to catch them so that they don't go everywhere. Um, it's helpful to have someone to help to, it's helpful to have some help. <laughs> 
No kidding. Um, it's helpful to have somebody else pouring for you so that you can kind of hold the opening. Um, otherwise, he kind of slouches and then you have to stand him up and sort of do it one handed and it can kind of be a little bit um, tricky. Um, you'll have to pause while you're filling because you'll kind of have to, it'll fill up and you'll have to put it down and get what I use is actually, you, they have like little stuffing sticks you can use, <clears throat> but actually like a chopstick or something. But I actually use a pencil with an eraser on the end. I find that helps with stuffing a little bit better. Um, with pellets, that might not matter. Um, with the polyfill stuffing, I think it does. Uh, but anyway, you'll need something to kind of poke the pellets through the arms and legs. So just, you know, know that it'll sort of take a minute to get everything in all the nooks and crannies. Um, then, you know, fill it all the way up as much as you can with, of course, the opening will still be open before you've grafted it because this is where you're filling. And I do recommend filling from here and not closing it and filling like through a leg or something. That would be really annoying. <laughs> Uh, take forever. But what I did do is um, to get, he's even still a little bit wonky in the eyes, but I actually even took some polyfill uh, actual stuffing and um, kind of jammed it up into the eye sockets and just sort of to fill out the top of the head so it didn't sink a little bit because the polyfill pellets will kind of gravitate down and you can get, you know, fill it up as much as you can, but it'll still be hard to fill it up perfectly without feeling like it's going to spill any minute while you're grafting. So to kind of take up that little extra space, I did use stuffing to kind of fill out the eyes so they didn't look all sunken. So I definitely recommend that. Um, what else? Uh, I didn't need to block him, uh, but I did block his hands and feet. And um, I did that after he'd been stuffed and sewn. That was fine. You can do it when he's, you know, flat before he's fully uh, put together, but either way is fine. But that'll give you, um, you know, so his feet aren't kind of curled up, like here they are in the back, and you know, the bottom of that foot is, you know, straight. I need to show you that. Straight and open, but it kind of curls. So that the whole foot usually looks like that. Um, and the, the fingers, the fingers are actually not too bad to do, um, but they're a little bit curly. So if you want them to stretch out, that's what I would recommend. And then again, that knit kitchener. Uh, so to make sure if you have trouble with the Kitchener stitch to close it up or the Kitchener graft, um, doing the knit Kitchener, looking that up, uh, either from Very Pink Knits or Roxanne Richardson or any other place on YouTube or something that you like to get um, your tutorials from, it's really helpful uh, to maintain an even tension if it's, a, if it's a stitch that gives you a problem. If it's not, then and you're great. So that's my last work in progress. So, somewhat finished because frog is complete, but we, we still need toad. What is frog without toad, right? Uh, so that's my last thing to share. Thanks for spending time with me in the outdoors with all the wild planes and motorcycles. Uh, hopefully I, cut, I was able to cut that out to give you the peaceful morning I've been trying to have. If you're looking for more from me in between podcast episodes, you can always find me at knit2stab1.com, which is my horror movie and knit blog where I talk about knit and crochet in a different horror movie every blog entry. So I hope you'll check that out. I'm clearly wearing out my, my quiet welcome out here, so I am going to sign off. Thanks for watching. Please like and comment. I'd love to hear from you and visit me over at my blog or anywhere on the web at Half Cap Crochet. I think that'll do it. Bye.